Greetings, dear listener. Last month, you heard episode six, diving deep into the health implications of experimenting with basic income in Canada with Evelyn Forget, Armin Yalnesian, and Danielle Martin. We did our best to take a balanced and comprehensive approach to the subject, but that meant leaving out lots of the conversation. Here's the rest of our interview with Armin Yalnesian, renowned economist with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives and a regular voice on the CBC. Thanks for joining me, Armin. Thank you, Jared. It's a pleasure. Um, so, talking about basic income and, get, and before we get into the compendium and stuff, um, maybe maybe you can start by just kind of talking about the why. Um, income inequality is an incredibly complex issue, and we know that in our current market system, we need income to have a healthy life. But does income inequality also affect the health of our communities at large? Yes, and that's because income inequality eventually morphs, as we're seeing in all of our big cities, and smaller ones too, actually, into spatial inequalities. You know, there's always been the good side and the bad side of town, but we're seeing poverty by postal code, and we're seeing cities um, with fewer middle-income neighborhoods and more rich and poor neighborhoods. So as income inequality, inequality morphs into lived experience, we're seeing people born into and being raised with different quality of housing, with different quality of education, of transit, of recreation, and of course of employment opportunities as a result. So income inequality actually triggers spatial inequality and what people in the healthcare business call deprivation amplification. And so to reduce your health inequalities that come out of this, it's not just about reducing income inequality. If you want to reduce income inequality long term, it requires you redistributing opportunity and building solidarity. And so consequently, closing the income gap, while important, is definitely not enough to change the way the game works. Do you, it's, it's such a simple idea in, in a certain way, just giving people money, but at the same time, for it, it's, it's being seen as so radical, and, and you know there may be other things we can do which are even more radical. But why do you think that this, this idea of, of just giving people money uh, is so popular now. Is there something about what's what we're experiencing now as a nation or, or internationally in trends that can explain the the hyper hyper popularity that it's gaining right now? Yeah, it's a little bit surprising how popular it has become so quickly. I think there's several things that are at play here. One is the idea that, you know, work used to be your ticket out of poverty. This is no longer the case. That's quite evident, especially for young people and the growing precariousness of work. And yet the government commitment to full employment has fallen off the agenda. And not only full employment, in places like uh, the United States where we have by the numbers what was officially full employment, which is a very low rate of unemployment, we're seeing elevated levels of poverty. So that is an issue that, of course, um, needs attention. It's not just the number of people that are working, but the quality of those jobs and the wages and income they are earning that requires um attention by public policy and if anything some forms of public policy such as opening the floodgates to temporary foreign workers has been making things worse for the next generation of newcomers and young workers so that's one thing is that we're we're taking our hands off the wheel on the thing that can most reduce that has traditionally most reduced poverty in our communities which is our jobs but the second thing is as um as in the last three decades or so, maybe two, two and a half decades, the real prevailing public policy priority has been governments putting money back in your pockets. That's their language. It's about tax cuts. And while basic income looks like a more progressive way of doing that, it is actually effectively the only, it's identical to a tax cut, except it's going to presumably going primarily to those at the bottom. Of course, we haven't discussed the design of this yet, but the idea of the basic income is that everybody gets a minimum 
minimum amount or or uh, the poor get uh, enough to lift them out of poverty. Those are kind of the two overarching ideas behind basic income. And in both cases, um, more money in your pocket doesn't buy you one more high quality child care space, doesn't build you, build you one more unit of affordable housing. So people have more money, but their lived reality is not substantially changed. And that's been something that you've you've focused on as as reducing not so much the gap in income but the gap in 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 consumption inequality. Uh, why why are things like child care and housing better options than solving things through an income fix? I'm not saying it's a better, but I'm saying it's worth a consideration of the opportunity cost, given how much it costs to put money into people's pockets, versus actually changing the uh, the the set of opportunities that are out there that are high quality for people of all income classes, which would help poor people the most if you designed the program to be that way. So why do I look at that? Well, we know when we look at social determinants of health that the number one issue in your health is how much you eat. And the quality of your nutrition, Valerie Tarasuk's uh, work has been extraordinary in this regard. But we also know that how much you can put on the table is a function of how much of your budget that is going to shelter costs. I've been working in this area for 30 years and for most of my life, I have heard the same refrain, if you solve the housing problem, you solve the hunger problem. So actually creating more units of affordable housing in our biggest cities in particular, where rates of poverty are highest, would go a long way to improving people's health. But secondly, we know from, again, the great work of uh, scholars in the social determinants of health, that if you want to improve health outcomes, you invest in people early in life. And the earlier you invest, the better the outcomes. And there are these very evocative curves for early childhood education, which when invested, particularly in low income households, uh, improve life chances, incomes and educational um, outcomes for these uh, for these young people and do so over the course of their lives. And the bonus of investments in early childhood education is they literally pay for themselves some fantastic work done in Canada by Pierre Fortin of Quebec uh, showed that every $100 of daycare subsidy paid out by the Quebec government generated a return of $104 for the Quebec public coffer and a windfall of $43 for the federal government. So literally, child care pays for itself and makes a huge difference in people's lives. And then the third thing that makes a big difference is transit because people are moving to the suburbs because they can't afford to be closer to where they work. So we either do it through urban planning, which we haven't been doing particularly well, as we've been adding housing stock to the cities. They tend to be in the downtown cores um, where people can't afford to live. Or we do it through um, bringing people uh, um to their work or to their school um, more efficiently through better public transit. So you can't bring in, I think it was a million people we brought into Canada last year. Every year we bring in more people. They are added to a housing crisis in the big cities and there's no transit to move them. So these are the three things, housing, early childhood education and transit that would make the biggest difference at a fraction of the cost. By the way, I mentioned these three things they would cost something like $7.6 billion a year, uh, according to the alternative federal budget, to be done properly. And at the end of 10 years, we have a bigger stock of child care spaces, of housing, of affordable housing, and of public transit options. Whereas with money in your pocket, it disappears and you see no growth in public assets. And, and talking about all these different things that are they're not only, in a way, easier to, to, to integrate, to implement, but also, you know, we know that they, pay, they in the long run, they pay for themselves, they're, they're, you know, giving people, you know, a housing first approach to living space, making sure everyone has enough to eat, investing in child, child care, things that we know for every dollar we get in, we get three, four, five dollars back. Um, why is it that we've, we've taken so long and why is it that people's attention are not 
grabbed by that. How can we make housing sexy so that we can make those things uh, at least come along for the ride with this new progressive social investment model? I think the basic income conversation actually simplifies things to a level where people think it's a magic bullet. And of course, there's all sorts of unintended consequences with this policy direction, which, uh, apart from its costs, could undo some of the good that it would do. But I think it has grabbed people's imagination in a way that it seems that government can't get anything right, and maybe this is something that it can get right. I don't think it will be easy to make housing sexy. Um, I think we are all freaked out by um, what is happening in places like Vancouver and Toronto, but also uh, before the collapse of oil prices in Calgary. These boom and bust, bust cycles make housing markets seem impenetrable and also unaffordable. And the idea that you could do something to beat the market seems unlikely. Where That's crazy because if we had had, for example, inclusionary zoning in any of these cities, we would have been riding this market and creating more affordable housing as a predictable share of all housing units built. So we kind of missed that boat, I think, at some level. Uh, and there's nothing, uh, there's nothing less sexy for people that don't have toddlers than early childhood education. And a lot of people, I think, are so um, increasingly, if, I mean, okay, I'm going to get a little meta on you here, Jared, but <laughs> if you think about what's going on right now in the United States and in Britain, in Britain, the, f the phrase Britain first uh, has really accelerated since the run-up to the Brexit vote and post-Brexit. In the United States, Trump is talking about uh, making America great again. And this me first policy is also uh, reflected in ad campaigns everywhere. Um, and I think we are in an era, uh, an, uh, the, a very I dominated era. I'm not, of course, the first to uh, talk about this, but um, the, the degree to which our political leaders from the top are sending the signal that it's fine to worry about yourself and why should you worry about anybody else is really accelerating this idea that we can collective action isn't where it's at. It's what have you done for me lately to channel Janet Jackson's great song? It's, like, it's how much money have you put in my pocket? And that's all I care. And that's the common denominator is cash. Um, but cash is not king. When it comes to um, an era where we are seeing much slower growth than we have seen in over a hundred years. And it appears that we have that trajectory on the horizon. We are going to need to use every dollar very wisely. It really does harken back to a Tommy Douglas sort of mentality, which was why spend a dollar when 99 cents will do. But that's now being considered a consumer thing. Right now, we should be looking at that from a government and a public provision point of view. Is there a way that we could be getting better access to the things we need to use every day that we would otherwise have to spend more money on? Is there a way of getting those things cheaper at scale? For example, oral health. For example, pharmacare. For example, post-secondary education. And of course, the top three in my list, which is housing, early childhood education, and public transit. So I think there are much better things we can be doing with our money, but it requires us acting together. And that is the tough nut to crack. When you talk about basic income, it's just simply how much money do I get and will it help me get by? When we're talking about these policies, it requires people working together and delivering together. And we're moving very rapidly away from that direction, the direction of collective action and solidarity and more in the direction of what, what have you done for me lately? And I think that's a problem at a very meta level absolutely you, you t talking about that problem is slow growth that's the that's in the title of your chapter of the new uh, ccpa um, compendium basic income solutions in an era of slow growth can you talk a little bit about what your goals were for that chapter and what the goals are of the ccpa for the compendium broad more broadly 
Well, I think the CCPS compendium comes out at a remarkable time in Ontario where we are um, about to discuss the way a basic income pilot pro program should be established. And what that compendium does is say this is a remarkable opportunity, the first perhaps in half a century to talk about the type of world we want to create through public policy and the role of the market in that. Um, so I think the compendium tries to lay out, here's the things that basic income can do, and perhaps is long overdue in doing, because, you know, it's not like we have evolved to some kind of nirvana when it comes to the welfare state. So are there improvements in our income supports that we can introduce now as the public's appetite for this discussion opens and government's interest in trying to do something in this direction also seems at a record high for the last uh, very long period of time. So uh, there's those positive, um, here's how you could improve income supports in Canada, or, or at least in Ontario, key amongst which is what are we doing about welfare? We cut welfare rates dramatically through uh, a conservative elected government in 1995. Those rates have never come back. For your listeners that are not in Ontario, uh, somebody, a, a single so-called employable person on social assistance in the Ontario Works Program would get no more than about $8,000 a year. And somebody who is proven disabled would get something like $14,000 a year. The uh, poverty rate in Ontario is something like $22,000 a year. So it gives you a sense of how far below poverty rates um, these these rates of assistance are. So there's been, as, as there has been across this country, lots of discussion in the intervening years from 95 till now uh, on how to improve or what to do about welfare. Nothing has been done thus far. So this is an opportunity to talk about how to improve welfare, including Im improving the dignity of those who receive uh, welfare by not having it overly intrusive. But I have to say basic income, the models that are the least intrusive go through the tax system and there will always be people that need emergency financial support. So we will always need some form of public support of last recourse that does judge and assess your need in order to turn on the tap for that public money. Uh, so even a basic income program wouldn't get, get rid of the need for some form of last minute social assistance. The um, compendium also looks at what are some of the unintended consequences of basic income? What would be the impact on women, for example? So we have, uh, not to fetishize paid work or anything, but we have seen a remarkable increase in women's uh, participation in the paid labor market in the last couple of decades. But we have also seen that every time we increase public income supports to families, for example, the what was under the Harper regime, the universal child care benefit, which was $100 a month, every time you turn on the taps on that sort of thing or income splitting, you see women's labor force participation rates drop. So we know that that's one of the things that will happen if you increase basic income. Women in particular will take the, uh, at the margins, will take the, alter the uh, alternative to paid work because of family obligations and for all sorts of other reasons, will do unpaid work in the home rather than do paid work uh, in the labor force, and we need to question whether that is something we want to do via public policy. Um, and as I said right off at the top, the biggest issue uh, that is raised by um, this compendium is the loss of focus on employment and living wages as 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 worthy a goal of public policy um, as a basic income. Instead of raising the white flag of surrender and saying the robots are going to eat all of our jobs, let's just give some people some cash. Let's actually start thinking about how do we create create a great labor market for the next generation of Canadians who are the most educated uh, people out there. Um, uh, we have never seen this level of education. Surely we can put that to good use without 
declaring defeat in the labor market. But they are also the most precariously employed generation of Canadians. And so in Ontario, another thing we're doing is revising labor force, uh, sorry, labor laws and employment standard, uh, uh, employment standards. So statutory um legislation that governs the rules of the road in the workplace. Lots more needs to be done, but these are all areas that we can use to improve equal pay, better working conditions, and making sure that everybody that's working gets a fair shake, not just the ones that are retiring, um, because the corporations are you know, busting through corporate profit records. So why is it that it's getting harder, not easier to pay actually a shrinking labor force. So these are questions that the compendium raises that we need to think about. And I'd like to think that my contribution also says we can do better with the money that we've got if we think about a nice mix between income and social supports that doesn't just put money in your pocket, but builds solidarity and builds opportunity while reducing uh, the things that ruin um, our, our, our health, essentially, through the social determinants of health, or maybe I should phrase that more positively, uh, by improving the social determinants of health and thereby seeing better outcomes, better health, and a better quality of life for everyone. I think, I think that your, your piece and your, your work in the last you know, several years has been such an important balancing force because so many people are on the hype train for, for basic income. And, and to have that, that other perspective of, or that, that other, um, to marshal some resources or, or some of that attention to the other, the other side of things is so crucial. Do you think, though, that in the, that context of precarity, our last, our last uh, episode of Upstream Radio, we spoke with folks like Andrew Cash mm-hmm. and Ritika Goal on, on the precarity problem. Uh, do you think that the, the, with the rise of casual labor and unpaid internships and self-employment, you know, automation where we see retail and fast food and, and transportation and, and, and uh, both, both for products through truck driving and, and you know, taxi drivers, Pittsburgh has already gone with has already got self-driving cars with drivers behind the wheel just in case. Do you see um, a present and future of a post-work Canada where we we might need to have some kind of income fix for the the people that just they're they're forget about working poor. There's just no more working. So I don't buy into there's no more working, though I appreciate that this time it could be different. And the reason I don't buy into it is because I look at um, I look back in history and see how many times this same narrative has been spun out. And in the wake of each one of these fears that there will be no more work, for example, textile manufacturers in England, uh, for example, um, people that were u- using horses for transportation um, instead of railroads and cars, for example, the rise of oil um, and automobiles, um, for example, uh, the earliest wave of robots in the 60s and 70s and the beginning of mechanization of the workplace. In the wake of all of these fears, the same conversation has occurred. And yet at the end of that period of trans- uh, technological transformation, there have been more jobs, not fewer jobs. Humans are endlessly inventive. And so I don't buy that we will have no jobs on the other side and we will need income support because so many people are going to be left um, out of the labor market. I do buy that this wave of technological change and this era of slow growth is going to lead to a, a rate of corporate consolidation that we have never, we have perhaps only seen a little bit over a hundred years ago when it it triggered antitrust, the rise of antitrust legislation to break up large, powerful corporations. I think we are moving towards a Blade Runner economy because we keep throwing up our hands at the prospect of collective action and really fetishizing dollars in your pocket and the ability for you to fix everything on your own, you know, and it doesn't happen that way. If corporations are consolidated, you're going to need even bigger bargaining power 
power on the other side of the ledger. That's either going to come through governments standing up and being arbiters for the well-being of their citizens, or it's going to come through some form of collective action, whether it's through unions or other mechanisms in civil society to form coalitions. Uh, you could maybe even look at what's happening with the pipeline debate as one of those nascent um, uh, stories of people getting together to say no uh, to uh, particular corporate forces. Um, but the reason I'm, I'm talking about this is because I think you cannot underestimate the power of solidarity. And when I think about the basic income, I think it undermines solidarity. I cannot imagine any scenario in which everybody's going to get a check cut for lifting them up above the poverty line. Any any analysis that has been done by any economist of what that would cost in Canada makes it extremely expensive. But let's say for whatever set of reasons, just as we have this unusual consensus that basic incomes should be test piloted in various jurisdictions, because this seems to be the next big thing. Let's say we have some weird consensus that says everybody should get a check to make sure nobody's living in poverty. Two things arise. Number one, these are just dollars chasing insufficient stock of housing, right? So that will raise the prices of everything too, unless you have rent control, unless you have price control. All you're doing is adding money and stirring, and that makes the market spin around faster with people searching for things that the stock of which has not increased. The second thing that happens is somebody is paying for somebody else to get so-called free money. Again, it's like the, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to use a music an, an analogy with dire straits, you know, um, money for nothing and your chicks for free. Um, the idea that somebody is going to get free anything and I'm paying for it drives taxpayers crazy. So even if you were to get there, I don't think the consensus would hold very long. And if you think there's been a tax revolt in the last 20 years, wait for the next 20 years if we should get what we wish for, which is adequate incomes for everybody through an income support system. Better for me to say, let's assure that everybody that is working is getting adequate incomes, that we are helping those who cannot work, whether they're seniored seniors or sick, episodically or chronically, um, or whether they're unemployed, that we help those people in those circumstances for adequacy. And part of that help is making sure that whether you've got money or you don't, there is access to the basics of life. And I've mentioned them before, and I'll mention them again. People should be able to go and upgrade their skills at any time for free through free post-secondary education. People's children should not be a massive drain on them when they go to work. Early childhood education should be heavily subsidized. Nobody should be worried in a country as cold as Canada about having shelter over their heads. And that requires a massive push in housing policy, Canada being one of the only nations in the world without a national housing policy, but cranking up the immigration numbers. Can you believe it? We're bringing in more and more people to the country and we have no place to put them and no transit for them because we have no policies. So so these are the sort of things that I think makes life more livable and reduces the tension between groups of people rather than cranking it up because we've accomplished something that may not even be needed in the end. Basic in income is not needed because of technological change. Basic income is needed because our forms of income support are either capricious or inadequate, and we can fix those things. And we can fix them through the tax system, but we're never going to be able to do it through some kind of cookie cutter system like a tax system. It will never be automatic. And so consequently, we will have to pay attention to the um, civility and the humanity of the income support systems that we've got and improve those. There's just no ducking that. That's a pretty that's a pretty awesome uh, roundup of the of the reasons uh, we shouldn't necessarily go gung ho for this or at all. Speaking of immigration, that's that's one of the the more popular uh, fears, uh, along with disincentivization for work. People uh, in the mainstream are, are discussed a lot. If we were to go with a system of just handing out money, 
isn't that going to incentivize uh, a greater deal of, of immigration to Canada to take advantage of that system? Do you think that's a precedent? Uh, do you think that that's a, um, a fear with some basis? Or is that not as much as is that not something we should be so focused on? At the moment, I think we have bigger fish to fry on the immigration front. I think that we, we are facing a humanitarian crisis in the Middle East that is not restricted to Syria, but the Middle East in general is topsy-turvy right now. And we have a federal government that has committed to opening up its immigration um, levels for refugees and for family reunification purposes. I think that's pretty awesome, though you're right that it may raise some issues, but some of those issues may be quite legitimate. People are coming here going through unbelievable trauma before they get here and may not be ready to jump into a job right away. <laughs> you know, them, it is possible that they will need to be physically and mentally healed for a while, but in the end will contribute more. So you, you do raise a, a legitimate question, but our bigger immigration policies are actually not associated with immigration, but with, as I mentioned before, the temporary foreign worker and temporary entry policies that would be... Um, what actually eclipse our immigration policy should the trade deals come through because of the temporary entry provisions in those policies, I mean, in, in those trade agreements? So I think our immigration issues actually may be more of a threat to full employment and gainful full employment, full employment that is good jobs, paying good wages, and providing good workplace benefits, those things need to be attended to. And when you attend to those things, everything follows apace. But if you take your hands off the wheel and just say whatever corporations want, corporations get, um, it's, it's always going to be a qu question of the government mopping up over these market failures, which are baked into the system because of policy. So I wouldn't worry as much about abuse of basic income by immigrants and having more people coming here and abusing the system as saying we don't need that system as heavily when we make sure the underlying market forces work for everybody, not just for a select few. Um, and that's the role of the government as much as redistribution is making sure that pre-distribution, the way the market actually delivers, is delivering optimally. And that's the part that I think has not received enough attention, and I hope will. Some really interesting things there to think about. I've, I've got one last question for you, Armin, and you might hate it. You're probably going to hate it, but I've got I've to ask it for the sake of, of, uh, of the, the, the journalist in me uh, for, for creating a, an interesting narrative here. If you woke up tomorrow with a phone call from Parliament Hill and, and they said, Armin, this basic income thing is going through, it's happening, we're rolling it out, and you, you could give them uh, a, a 30 second or a one minute pitch to, to make it as, as beneficial as possible or as least problematic as possible. What would you say to them? You're right. I hate your question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess my pitch would be spend at least half of what you're spending on basic income on providing basic services and see what happens. Okay. Excellent. Groovy. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you that you want to get out there as part of the the conversation? Just to say that I don't think solidarity has been explored enough in an era of slow growth. Everything starts to look like one person's loss is a, one person's gain is someone else's loss. I think it is a very it, slow growth really creates fractious politics, increasingly so, and we are seeing evidence of it all over the world. And at that moment, you get a lot of leaders that are telling you, think about yourself first and foremost. Um, I think we are in for a lot of trouble if that's the only way we can think our way through solutions to problems is how, does, how do I benefit from it? Whereas collective action solutions uh, may reduce the costs, improve the outcomes, and reduce the tension. And it is time for us to think about 
what forms of collective action, rather than dollars in our pockets, are going to fix this era of slow growth that I fear is upon us for a few decades, which may not be the worst thing in the world, uh, but is viewed as some kind of economic catastrophe. And um, slow growth is not a catastrophe, but it does need to be managed in a way that none of us have had to consider in the last over a, over a hundred years. So nobody has lived memory of how to deal with the prospect of economies growing very slowly and what that means for living peaceably together. And um, I don't think basic income is the solution to that. What a great call to action to end on. Thank you so much, Armin, for speaking with us today and uh, and for all the work you continue to do on this front. Thank you very much, uh, Jared. I know it's not the most popular view um, out there, but I really appreciate the opportunity to put some flesh around its bones. And to our wonderful Upstream community, thanks for listening and for keeping the conversation going with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you think our messages are important, please consider donating at thinkupstream.net slash donate and help us take the mainstream upstream. You really can make a difference in what we do. Like Upstream Radio? You can also help out by liking, subscribing, and giving five-star ratings to the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and wherever else podcasts live. Join the Upstream conversation by commenting on Facebook, tweeting at us, or email us a voicemail or a voice memo at storyshop at thinkupstream.net to have your say about what really determines our health in upcoming episodes. Until next time, keep thinking Upstream.